Hello, and thank you for joining us with Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson from Heritage Mississauga. Each week, we invite you to send in your stories, your questions, things you're curious about, and we'll explore them together here on Ask a Historian. Well, this week on Ask a Historian, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome back once again, uh, Elizabeth Underhill, Supervisor of Museums and Education at the Museums of Mississauga. And uh, we, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the exciting new exhibit, Our Boys, which is at uh, the museums, uh, particularly at Bradley and Benares and the other locations as well. Um, but uh, another exciting initiative, uh, tying in, I guess, thematically from the First World War perspective, and running concurrently, although with slightly different dates of its own, uh, soon to open, actually uh, will be opening on the 17th, uh, open to the public on the 18th of September, is Warflowers. Um, I'm most excited to see a, a traveling exhibit uh, of, of uh, incredible visuals of what we've seen online. Uh, Elizabeth, I just uh, thank you for joining us uh, and uh, wondering if you can uh, talk a little bit about Warflowers and, and what people can expect. Yeah, thanks for having me back again. It's always great to chat. Um, so yeah, War Flowers is an incredible exhibition that the museums of Mississauga are very fortunate to be able to bring to the city of Mississauga. Um, it originated in Quebec. It's uh, organized by um, an institution called Jardin de Métis at, or Reefford Gardens. And this exhibit has actually traveled to Vimy Ridge. Um, and it's been in a couple places across Canada as well. And it's closing out its run right here in Mississauga. So we're the last ones who will get to visit it. Um, and it tells the story of um, 10 different Canadians in the First World War and their contributions and sacrifices uh, to the war effort. Um, and the title um, has this really beautiful story behind it. Um, it's called War Flowers because um, the, the curator, the artist and curator who put it together um, was able to uh, collect these letters that one of the soldiers from the First World War had sent home to his baby daughter um, while he was overseas in Europe. Um, and uh, his name, uh, I, I did, unfortunately, <laughs> I did get it backwards the last time we spoke, so um, my apologies for that, but it's George Stephen Cantley. Okay. Um, and what he did was everywhere he was traveling throughout Europe, he would he'd pick a flower, he'd press it into a letter for his baby daughter Celia and send it home to her in Montreal. And so uh, Viveka Melki, who is the curator and artist behind uh, the exhibition, she has created these displays inspired by the flowers uh, in those letters um, and the meaning that those flowers hold. Um, so there's, and there are many different components to it. Um, you know, you've got, you've got imagery of the pressed flowers. She's also had crystal sculptures made um, of the flowers because trying to include them in the exhibition was sort of challenging. How do you take these little botanical specimens that are over a hundred right. years old and, and send them around the world? So they're represented through uh, optical crystal sculptures. She's also um, involved a perfume artist from Quebec, um, Alexandra Bachand, who's created scents um, to accompany the stories of the 10 Canadians involved in the war. And each of the 10 uh, personalities, uh, they're also associated with a different kind of universal theme or a theme that represents the human experience of war um, that Viveka has brought to this story. So there are things like, uh, I think, uh, mother's love, innocence, um, it's really, and so the scents are meant to evoke these, these themes um, and tell the stories and, and the experience of war, so. Well, Multi-layered and multifaceted, really. It's, it, it's beautiful. I've seen some of the artwork for, around it and it just, it's stunning. And uh, I don't think, there's nothing I can compare it to really. Um, 
uh, from from what I've seen, the, just the multiple levels and, and and the beauty of the of the of the crystal sculpt sculpture is that the right word or crystal yeah. etchings? Um, yeah. and, and I haven't read the stories of the soldiers yet. I'm looking forward to that. But uh, uh, for those that are interested, we will post the the website link to it. Um, it is a, a ticketed free event uh, through the Living Arts Center. Uh, so it's at whole host. If, if you're looking for it at the museums, it's not at the museums. It's at the Living Arts Center. Um, and uh, again, something incredibly unique. Uh, it uh, opens on the 17th of September. And how long does it run? Um, it runs until December 13th. December 13th. And uh, it's open Wednesday to Sunday at the Living Arts Center. But yes, you do need to you need to book your your ticket to get in. It's all very much. COVID safety yeah. ready to go. So. And the, the link will be on the website that we uh, we posted at the end of this um, for, for the ticket event. And again, that's through the Living Arts Center box office, uh, but it is free. Um, and, uh, you know, sticking to the, the theme of the First World War as well, it runs concurrently with Our Boys, which is currently open. Mm -hmm. uh, so Our Boys running from the beginning of September until January. I don't have the date in my Ten. head. But Tenth, there we go. <laughs> Till January tenth. So, so two themes, both connecting to the First World War, um, both quite different um, in terms of the experience and the and the memories therein. Uh, our boys focusing on uh, Mississauga's connections to the First yeah. World War, and then our flowers, our our, our flowers, our boy, war flowers. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> war flowers connecting to that larger lived experience. And and what uh, I, I remember reading the story of. Uh, of, and he's an officer. Is it Major Cantley? I can't. I can't remember what rank. Oh uh, no, uh, Lieutenant. Lieutenant. Um, um, but the emotions that it evokes, these letters that he would send home with these pressed flowers, for me, as uh, just just reading it, I, I find that a, a really incredibly powerful moment. I mean, these, these potentially are flowers from the battlefield, um, and, and to think that they not only were this care taken to, to share these stories and these moments of, you know, for lack of a better word, of beauty uh, with his infant child um, from a, a place that was being yeah. torn apart um, yeah, is, is, is really a powerful statement and, and to see it brought to life like this and, and to know that the family preserved it too is, is quite an amazing thing. And yeah. like I said, the, you mentioned that over a hundred years ago uh, yeah. and just powerful. So, Kudos to the museum team uh, to, to bring this and uh, looking forward to, to seeing it and the programming there. And how, the, what is, um, are you doing any, any, I know in these days of COVID things are a little strange, um, but uh, are you doing kind of programming the public would engage with when they go to the exhibits? I'm putting you on the spot for that because I didn't ask it in advance. But. No, that's <laughs> fine. That's fine. Well, one thing before I, I say that, I do want to make sure I, I do get his name uh, correct because I I don't want to be disrespectful, but it is uh, it's Lieutenant Colonel Lieutenant George Lieutenant. Stephen Cantley. Right, okay. Lieutenant. Because we can't. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the programs at the the Living Arts Center for War Flowers, we don't have anything in person. It's really just the tour through right. um, the ten different stations. Um, it also includes. All, the names of all the fallen um, uh, Canadian soldiers really? in the First World War. Wow. Yeah. Um, so it's been very emotional for the, the team installing that and just like faced with this reality. Yeah. Um, when people visit the, the site, um, they will be able to talk to our interpretive staff who will be there. So if they have any questions or would like more information, our staff will be there to, to assist them. But really everything that we're doing is online um, and it kind, of, it kind of brings together War Flowers and Our Boys, um, our online programs. So we kind of chatted a bit about that last time. We did, we did. Uh, and, and it's just, uh, I mean, they're powerful at any time. Uh, I think one of the things I'm, uh, Looking, uh, looking forward sounds wrong, but uh, these will be running during Remembrance Day. Um, and this year, we don't know what next week's going to look like, let alone two months from now. Um, Remembrance Day services might look a little different uh, this year. Um, and 
you know, here are two ways. I, I remember it's a bad segue. Uh, several years ago, we did the Sudorain exhibit uh, down with the bringing the, the rock cave carvings to, to Mississauga. And that also had the remembrance connection to it. And it was a fascinating way to connect in a different scope than, than the normal remembrance services. And I, th I think this offer, the War Our Boys and Warflowers um, really do, uh, they're, they're, they're strong and they're poignant now, but I think come November, we'll, we'll certainly have a, an even stronger connection to what's happening around us. Um, and, and just, I'm excited to see it. It's, it's exciting. I, I, you know, I, I wanted to see it in person and, and explore it myself, but, uh, encouraging anyone to check out the website link. Um, uh, if you have an opportunity to go to the museums and see our boys, uh, book in advance, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, that's available through the Eventbrite through the museums page. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, again, if you go to our, the, um, our website, the, um, mississaugaculture.ca and you find the museums page on there, uh, when you go to the Our Boys listing, there is a little link there where you can uh, book your tour of Our Boys. Right. So. so again, en encourage anyone to, to, to check out both because these are unique. Uh, I mean, uh, exhibits come and go and seasons change and new exhibits come in. Uh, they don't run forever and, and uh, particularly Warflowers is unique because you said this is the last stop on a, on a national and international journey. Um, so go and see it uh, and uh, explore the website, but uh, websites by nature can only give a fraction of the story. And, and uh, Oh, it, it's so true. I mean, I've seen so many pictures of the exhibition and now I'm getting pictures of the installation at, at the Living Arts Center and it's like, okay, wow, that's what it looks like, um, because you have the beautiful glass wall of the Living Arts Center um, and, and the exhibition right beside that, and it's oh, wow. almost okay. like a cathedral type of experience, like it's very elevated and uh, very respectful. Um, it's just very different, and, and when you're in there at the different stations, you know, those perfumes that were developed, um, you'll actually have the ability to like press a button and, and smell the perfume that has been created. So it's, it's really an immersive, yeah. um, unique experience. Immersive is a great term. I, I, that's one of the things that I think I'm most looking forward to, to, to seeing is, uh, and exploring this myself. And, uh, um, again, thank you, uh, Elizabeth, for, for joining us and for sharing this and, uh, for your hand and your team and, uh, and Megan at the museums and, and probably countless others, uh, he said Lindsay's oh. there. Lindsay's there working on it now, and yeah. uh, there is a talented crew at the museums that are bringing this to life and uh, and, and working with more flowers again. Our boys already open. Um, uh, I look forward to exploring it. Thank you for sharing it with Mississauga, and uh, um, it's absolutely fascinating. And so, I encourage anyone watching this go out and see it. If you have questions, send them in. We'll bring Elizabeth back on. <laughs> else to come on they're all busy putting up these exhibitions so. you're camera shy and <laughs> yeah we got to talk about that too yeah. Yeah. but um yeah. uh, again thank you for this and uh, uh best of luck with the exhibits um uh and uh and uh, uh again just thank you to the team yeah and, uh, no thank you and thanks to heritage mississauga for all your support um with the project um and if i if i have a moment to give a shout out to a couple other supporters. Yep. Um, we wanna make sure we recognize the Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archives and the, um, the Olinsky Museum. We also were able to, um, we wouldn't have been able to do this exhibition without the support of uh, some very lovely, generous sponsors yep. um, and funders. So Government of Canada uh, through Veterans Affairs and um, uh, Ministry of Heritage. They are, both contributed um, and the Friends of the Museums of Mississauga um, sponsored the exhibition and they received funding through the Community Foundation of Mississauga. So, to it, it cannot do it without people. our partners. Cannot do it without our partners. Absolutely. Um, and, and it, it just, uh, what's the old adage? It takes, it, it takes a village to village. raise a child. Uh, you know, it takes a team to bring anything to fruition. And uh, uh, thank you for that and for, for, for uh, the museum leading the way on, on this one and uh, really brings uh, this story to life in, in Mississauga in, in a very powerful way. So um, 
thank you for that. So today on Ask a Historian, uh, we're welcoming uh, John Dunlop, who is the Manager of Heritage Planning and Indigenous Relations for the city. And I, I brought John on, or he, he's, he's, he's uh, been willing to come on. Uh, we've had a, a number of questions around heritage conservation uh, and uh, the process by which and the principles by which uh, heritage conservation is guided in the city of Mississauga. Uh, one of the aspects I get involved with, uh, although I deal with the uh, through Heritage Mississauga, I deal with a lot of the, the cultural histories and uh, um, uh, general history of a property and people that live therein. Um, but I also work uh, as a, I'm a citizen representative and volunteer on the Heritage Advisory Committee, which is part of the process of, of heritage conservation in the city. And uh, so I wanted to bring John on to talk about the, 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 the general, uh, how heritage conservation happens in the city of Mississauga and beyond. Uh, we're our uh, follow provincial guidelines. So, uh, thank you, John, and, and just uh, kind of throw it out there in a generality sense of, of what is the process by which properties are conserved, uh, evaluated, uh, co uh, considered for adaptive reuse projects and things like that. I, I, I mean, it, we can open up a can of worms here and there are some case studies that we can, we can talk about, but I just wonder if, if you can kind of share your expertise and your guidance on, uh, you know, somebody comes to you and says, how do I protect a property? Well, thank you very much for having me, Matthew. Um, that's a really great question, really great topic. Um, the city of Mississauga, we've got about 1,500 properties which are considered heritage in the city. So there's a lot of heritage properties that exist within the city. And what we have, it's built into our planning process. It's built into our development process. Um, and that comes down from the province is that heritage is something that's important and is considered um, to have provincial significance and therefore uh, it's something that has to be checked and analyzed uh, during a development process. Uh, so what that means is um, we have a list, it's called the city's municipal heritage register and every single one of those 1500 properties is on the heritage list. Um, and so if anything comes in, if it's a building permit, if somebody's bought the property and wants to uh, do a teardown and rebuild, or if a developer buys the property and wants to redevelop it, um, the planning and the building department within the city will uh, liaise, will get in touch with us. And part of the process then becomes uh, meeting the heritage requirements on that property. So um, the, uh, the province regulates heritage across the entire province through a piece of legislation known as the Ontario Heritage Act. And it came out in 1974 and it's been revised a few times, but it, it sets out the general rules about how municipalities are supposed to address heritage. And so as, as you alluded to uh, in your introduction, one of the ways in which that happens is um, a committee, an advisory committee to city council has to be created. So that's the Heritage Advisory Committee. So Mississauga has one, we meet monthly, um, and staff meets with the, the committee and goes over any application that's come forward on any heritage property. And then the committee has the ability to uh, comment on it and provide their recommendations on to council about how council should address these issues. And that can come anything from uh, somebody wants to put an addition on a heritage house, uh, somebody wants to tear a heritage house down uh, to somebody just needs to make some changes, they need to update the, the doors and the windows and so forth. Um, any means in which a heritage property gets altered has to go through this process. And ultimately it is council that has the final decision. Council has the final decision, that's correct. And we, we talk about in terms of just heritage property and, and I guess maybe come back to our original, part of our original question. Uh, what determines heritage property? So there's a couple of things that determine heritage property. The first, given the term heritage, typically is age. Um, there isn't a set set of guidelines as to how, how old something has to be in order for it to be heritage. Um, infrastructure, ironically, in the province is given um, a, a guideline of about 40 years, which isn't very old. Um, typically, on a building or a structure, a rough estimate is maybe around 100 years. It has to beat that century mark in order to be considered heritage. But again, the age isn't, is really just a starting point. Um, the, what's more important are um, what is the building? Is it a unique building? 
Um, is it built with unique materials? Is it built in a unique way? Is it representative of uh, an architect that was starting out early in their career and went on to some prominence? And then there's the, there's the context information. Was it, is it considered a landmark? You know, when you're walking down the street and you see the same house that's been there for your entire lifetime, maybe your parents' entire lifetime, that, that becomes a landmark. You know, that's something that people consider that, that has an identity to them, that it's part of their community. Was there somebody prominent that lived there? Um, and, and is there, um, has it been featured in artwork? You know, um, uh, A.J. Casson, who's uh, part of the Group of Seven, as, as you well know, um, started off his painting career in Meadowville Village here in Mississauga and uh, painted some of the village. So having an artist that becomes a, arguably one of the national artists for the country um, painting your house suddenly gives that house much more prominence than, say, the more average house. And you also uh, uh, just, we don't need to spend a, a great deal of time on the individual criteria. Um, there are, that is something that is referenceable. Uh, I believe on the Heritage Planning website, you've got, uh, there, there's menus there with the Heritage Conservation Principles. And uh, uh, it, I guess where, where I'm leading here is it's not a willy-nilly thing uh, for you. Use, use an official term, not a willy-nilly thing. Um, yeah, but uh, the, uh, there is a process by which an application is made. There's a process by which an application is reviewed and, uh, Judged sounds a little too uh, critical, but uh, uh, the, 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 there is an established, uh, through the province, there's an established criteria against which things are evaluated. That's correct. There's, um, there's guidance material put out by Parks Canada. Um, there's guidance material put out by the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism, and Cultural Industries, if I have that in correct order. <laughs> um, there's... Um, and then we, the city has also published materials on how this is, how it's reviewed. Um, what we typically require is a study done by the property owner, whoever owns the heritage property, and that's carried out by a heritage expert. And there are, just like there's experts in every single field, there's heritage consultants, um, and they've been working with heritage properties for their entire professional careers. They're extremely knowledgeable on aspects of architecture and so forth. Um, and they carry out an analysis of the property. They do a, th uh, a thorough review of the property's history uh, to determine, again, as, as, as I brought up, is there anybody prominent that used to live on the property? They will do uh, an analysis of the, um, of the property itself, of the building. Um, they'll look Stratton, at how the structure of the building, the structure of the building, how it was made, what its condition is, and that's something that's actually... Um, quite important is, um, you know, structurally is the building sound, um, you know, does, is it in good, is it in good enough shape or is it one that hasn't seen any work done on it in 60 years and is in danger of collapse? Right. Um, is it, does it exemplify a type of architecture? Um, I don't, I think a lot of, you know, um, I don't, I'm not sure if you're, if, if your audience knows that there's actually an entire style of architecture from the 19th and early 20th century called the Ontario vernacular. And that's because it's a type of architecture that is unique to this part of the world, to Southern Ontario. And you only find it in Southern Ontario. And when you start to drive through the countryside, when you start to look at the houses, um, you quickly recognize what an Ontario vernacular house looks like. But that's something that's unique. That's something that's worth um, looking to, to further um, protect, you know, during a development. So one of the, uh, and, and again, I, I love the looking at our architectural styles. And uh, one of the things that's fascinating is to find the, the, the local connections, if you will, to some of those uh, historic styles that are found throughout Canada, throughout, throughout North America. Um, and we can go through, you know, whether it be Edwardian or Victorian or Gothic revival, or you know, and, and they're fascinating to look at. I mean, Mississauga has examples of, I would say, almost all styles of architecture. Where we've even got the eclectic Spanish in one of the building. Um, uh, Queen Anne, a little bit underrepresented. We've got American four score, but you can go on and on. Um, but one of the questions we had, and maybe we can look at it as kind of a, a, a microcosm of, of conservation and, and and reuse. But we had a question around the Barber House. Um, you know, here is here is one that uh, visually people can see something happening on that property today. And I know as a member of the Heritage Advisory Committee, there was uh, a lot of back and forth 
discussion about what the future of that property would be. And people now see those decisions that were made months and years ago starting to be starting to take place. Uh, wondering if you want to chat a little bit about kind of the the process of the Barber House and and where it's headed in the near future. Sure, we're going to see a change. Absolutely, there is there is going to be a change, and that's actually that's something that's that's part of a heritage property is there's and i don't want to say it's a misconception because it's a very good conception that the goal of heritage is preservation um and that really is the goal but but preservation doesn't mean ever freezing something in time a heritage property uh like the city itself is something that's going to grow and change over time um and, and that's that's an example when you start to look back through archival images of a single property, you'll see that it does grow and change over time. Maybe a house suffered a fire 100 years ago and had a wing rebuilt or the, the, the roof was replaced and so forth. Um, I think the most prominent example going larger than the city is um, the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, which suffered the fire. And there was a long discussion about how it would be restored. And it was ultimately decided to return it to um, the original roof lines and so forth. But that was a very long process with a lot of discussion and dialogue about how that would happen. And despite the fact that some people may feel there's worlds of difference between the Notre Dame Cathedral and a house in Mississauga, there really isn't. It's actually the exact same process that we go through. I, there's, there's various differences because of jurisdictions, but really it's the same process. And so with the Barber House, you had a large property um, that had a single house on it. And it was privately owned. Um, it was a restaurant, I believe, before um, it went under redevelopment. And when a development like this comes in, that the property is already designated under the Ontario Heritage Act. So there's a level of protection there. Um, and a developer will come in and let it be known that they wish to redevelop. And so the first thing is um, they actually do something. They actually put together what's known as a conservation plan. And that conservation plan, again, is prepared by uh, an outside consultant. Oftentimes there's an engineer involved. And um, the conservation plan is basically gonna speak to the specifics of, we understand that this is a heritage house. We understand that it has to remain. Um, and, it's, and it's the pitch of what they're going to do at that house so that it is maintained in its new development context. Um, and the, the guidance for that really is, Part of the heritage process is whenever you protect a house through designation, you pass a bylaw. So it's a city bylaw, it's a city law that enshrines that house and its protections. And one of the aspects that go into that bylaw is all the aspects of that property that make it heritage. So is it its architectural style? Is it, is it the sight lines? Um, the Barber House is something that is a landmark. So one of the discussions back and forth um, that was had was making sure that it remains, it retains its prominence. I mean, right now there's construction hoarding up around the property, but that's temporary. When that comes down, you want to be able to see the hair, see the house, you know, and that it's not suddenly surrounded by new development or anything. It's still there. Right. It's still visible in the street and so forth. Um, what's actually happening in the house itself is it's just being changed from a restaurant to some residences. Um, so that's, that's the changes. And then there's work that needs to happen on the building itself. Uh, heritage buildings um, always require structural work. That's just part and parcel of having a, a hundred plus year old building. Right. And so, but again, that's not just something that we go ahead and allow someone to do. Um, part of that process is finding out what exactly the work is going to be, finding out what materials are going to be used, and oftentimes going so far as to find out who are the uh, tradespeople that are going to be doing the work. We want to see their CVs, and we want to know that um, you have people that that know what they're doing when it comes to working on heritage houses, because working on a heritage house is different than your standard construction. There are a lot of issues that come up while you're working on it, um, especially if you're dealing with one that's you know, started with uh, gas lighting interior and then moved to electric and, uh, you know, you can open up a wall and suddenly discover a whole bunch of wires and lines and knob and tube wiring and so forth. And it's just a mess. And you need, you need somebody that's trained and an expert on dealing with those issues and cleaning that up, but then restoring it so that it doesn't look like you ever opened that wall to begin with. I was going to say, historically speaking, many of these properties did not have heritage experts working on them for generations. So 
it's, uh, no, exactly. And, and, <laughs> and that's you, you had a tradesperson come in and maybe patch a hole in your wall. So maybe there's repair work that was done 60 years ago that you have to go back and redo. Um, right. And that takes time. And that's something that, uh, that needs to be taken under consideration. And that's something that um, staff working with the Heritage Advisory Committee will review. We review all these plans um, before giving council that recommendation that allows um, permits to be issued and developments to move forward. Right. Um, and do from the Heritage Advisory Committee perspective, I know like I, I'm, I'm trying to view this as somebody looking from the outside in because I'm, I'm on the inside of that part. Uh, but uh, I mean, an application comes through staff, it's been vetted, it's been, uh, I, 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 forgive me if I don't have the right terminology for you, but you viewed it as complete uh, as an application. It then comes before the Heritage Advisory Committee, which involves a discussion of committee members chaired by a member of council um, for a recommendation. Um, things can be turned back at the Heritage Advisory Committee or, or, or uh, I guess, uh, Heritage Advisory Committee doesn't always recommend things uh, or approve things. Um, what's the process for that? Like, how, how, do, how does something go through those channels and finally make it way, its way to council? I guess that's where I'm going with yeah. that question. So an application, so, so our office will receive the application. We have um, documents that are known as terms of reference that are basically the guidelines and the rules about what we want to see in all these reports that we take in. So as, as you said, in order for an application to be deemed complete, it has to meet all those rules, you know, and that breaks down the, what do we want to see in these reports? Does it have these sections in it you know has the work been have they included all the required sections is the information there that's required in order for hack to make its decisions to council basically right. um once we've determined that that's correct and and this isn't necessarily an easy topic if you have a property that's had a deep history or a property that's undergone significant alteration in the past the meaning that it's been built and rebuilt and it's changed and so forth you can have and, and, and I know you've seen it, but you can have these reports that are sometimes three, 400 pages long yeah. and very in depth. And the other part of it is we want to see what the final product is going to look like. So we need to know what are the intent on that property. It isn't just we want to make changes. Here's our permit. It's we want to see what this is going to look like. Walk us through your process. We need to evaluate the entire thing. Once they've met those um, conditions, then um, we bring it on to to hack um, and again hack meets monthly because the uh, the Ontario Heritage Act does dictate timelines on um, how long a person should wait from when an application comes in to when they hear from the city right. um, and so there's a set amount of time that that legally the city has in order to review this and make their decisions um, if an application comes in for example saying this property, you know, the heritage consultant has done the analysis and said, this property doesn't meet the requirements for heritage. And so we think it's okay to be demolished. Ha uh, staff will first review that. And if we disagree with that, the application still goes forward because it's, it's legally required to. But we will make a recommendation onto, the, onto HAC, onto the Heritage Advisory Committee to say, we staff disagree. We disagree with the findings in this report. We then have to be able to back up why we disagree. We don't get to just say we don't disagree. We have to back it up with our own research. So we need very good cause to do that. Um, and then it falls to hack to, to review both sides and say, no, we're going to agree with the property owner on this, or no, we, we're, we agree with staff. And, um, and then that decision goes on to council. Council can again take another look at this. Um, if there's new information that's come to light or the property owner asks council, you know, this is, these are the circumstances and wants to make a pitch. That's still allowable. This is a very democratic process. It's right. actually one of the most democratic processes I think I've ever seen. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion and consideration. Uh, and, and then council does have that final decision. And if, it, it, if council decides to go ahead, then we can issue the permits and the project can move forward. If there's information that's lacking or conditions that want to be put on a permit, and that happens fairly frequently, I'd say it happens at least once a year, that an application comes in and there's some conditions attached, like there's a large amount of work that needs to happen on the building. And so we want to take out, the city has the option to take out securities. We can enter into legal agreements specific to the heritage work on the property, which says 
we, we sign an agreement with the developer, the property owner between the city and, the, and that, and the property owner that says that they will follow the, the heritage plan um, or be, or open themselves up to legal, a legal challenge. Um, and there's other conditions that can be made, like maybe we'll only allow some of the work to move forward and we want more information on other ones. There's some flexibility in how that can happen. And so we can issue a conditional permit. In cases where there's just a general disagreement, um, the city doesn't have to issue a, um, a permit, but then the property owner has a right to appeal that and they can appeal it um, directly to the Provincial Land Planning Tribunal, which is now known as LPAT. Um, and um, they can appeal decisions of council regarding heritage there, but that's an expensive and time-consuming process, which typically costs a lot of money because lawyers are involved, um, and it can take years to get a resolution through. So there is a recourse on that, but typically what we try and do then is if, if the application is turned down and the permit isn't issued, staff go back and sit down with the property owner or the developer and take another look at things and, and listen to the feedback that's given by Hack and possibly by council about what is it that wasn't accepted. And we try and find that resolution. And then we can go back through the process again. And that avoids having to go to arbitration on an issue. So it can become a very complex and legal process, but we do work very hard um, to avoid that. I was going to say, I know that there is that back and forth and uh, applicants are welcome at the Heritage Advisory Committee as well to, to, to discuss. And like you said, it is a democratic process. And I, I also, you, you mentioned it earlier, and I think it's really good to, to uh, uh, kind of connect it. it. It's not about stopping or arresting development. It's about managing change. Um, and, and the process is there for that reason. Um, I've often said this, you know, an empty heritage building doesn't do anyone any good. Um, you know, buildings are meant to have breath in them. They're meant to have people in them. They're meant to have a purpose. They're meant to be functional. Uh, and functionality changes as time changes. But you hope that, you know, elements of a building, elements of a property can be conserved, preserved, and adaptively reused as its function changes. Uh, and that, I think that's your, your, the whole process of this, right? Well, that's it exactly. As you said, our slogan is managing change. You know, it's Mississauga is growing and it's growing quickly and it's growing from an agrarian agricultural area um, with a couple of little villages into one of the largest, well, sixth largest, you know, maybe soon to be fifth. Um, <laughs> it's city. a race, right? <laughs> it's a race, yeah. Um, but it's a growing, it, it's a growing big city, you yeah. know, and that means we have to manage and we have to pay respect to what was there previously, but that doesn't mean necessarily leaving things the way it was. It was accepting part of that change and finding a way to celebrate what was there. There may come a point where there is a building that does meet all the regulations under the Ontario Heritage Act that, that says this is worthy of preservation and designation. But because of the nature of a development, there's alternate ways in which that story is told. Um, it could be interpretation on site. It could be, you know, and, and, and we're looking beyond just putting up an interpret interpretive sign, but um, it could be, there, there's a lot of different ways that we're looking towards interpretation because as you said, protecting a house, protecting a structure, then to just have it sit empty for 20 years absolutely does nobody any good. The whole point of, of heritage is actually as a community benefit. And an empty derelict house does not serve a community benefit. It actually creates a hindrance because inevitably they get broken into, um, they get there are accidents that happen in them. In a lot of cases, you get wanton fires and so forth um, in an abandoned building. That needs to be avoided. Um, and so it's better to sit with a property owner and find a way to make it work for them and keep that building, keep that, that life breathing through that building. Um, it, it often comes down to a compromise, you know, but it's a compromise that, that everybody, because of the democratic process in which heritage has, it's a, it's, it's a compromise that everybody's had a voice in. And so it's not something that is just determined by a single person or a single side in this. Um, and that's, that's a really important aspect of what we do is that there is always that aspect of 
negotiation as we go through this because we don't ever we don't ever come in and say no and that's personally there are a lot of times that we would like to say no we don't we would say this isn't a very this this property has a very rich history and it would be great if it was left alone but that's just not the way that it works and so we have to accept that there's going to be change and then we our our role is to step in and help manage that and I guess that maybe that's a, a good segue uh, into a, a follow-up question with that. And sometimes from the general public, I see it in, in, in my office, and I, I know, know that you do, um, sometimes an awareness or a concern comes forward uh, when a property is lost or uh, in whatever, pro, whatever the, the, the rationale or decision-making that has led to it, a property has become dem is demolished or is, is, is awaiting demolition. And that's when you tend to get some community awareness that, hey, why, why isn't this heritage or why isn't, and, and I think where I want to go with that is just to reassure that it has gone through this process. It, it, it has been evaluated. There has been discussion. It's not that these things happen blindly uh, for, for the most part. And, 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 and without going into kind of specific examples, I just want to reassure that there is this review that happens. Uh, yeah. There's, there is, there are cases and they are exceedingly rare. Um, the, this, and this is a point where we don't ever want to end up. The Heritage Act does allow a municipality to lay charges when something is demolished without going through this process. Um, and sometimes, and, and charges are very rarely laid. And that's because oftentimes when we start our investigation, we discover that um, it was uh, more ignorance of this process, somebody didn't know, um, than somebody willfully destroying something. If, if a building that, that people think is heritage comes down, that doesn't happen um, without a permit that's gone through this process. You know, that's, if it is, it is, it is 100% an accident, you know, that, um, because there's, it, ours is just a part of the process on getting, being able to demolish a building in the city. Um, just getting a permit from heritage, um, you still have to go through the city's uh, building office and they screen everything and pass everything on to us. So it's, there's no, it's not, it, it's something that's been evaluated. We've gotten the reports in, the discussions have been had at HAC and have continued on maybe even at council. Um, and it's not something that is, it's not a, a decision that's taken lightly. So, and, and, and so it's, and I, completely understand that somebody might see a building that they consider a landmark and see it come down. Um, and that's only because there's a very good reason why that building came down. And that could be, um, you know, once, once the heritage experts and the engineers got into the building, it was just unsound. Um, and what we don't do is we don't typically, unless we have an exceedingly important building, we don't require that an unsound building be brought back because that's, that is an expense that is an incredible expense that often costs two or three times the cost of a building and it, it becomes almost punitive, you know? So then we look to what you will see in cases where a building comes down is, as I spoke to is interpretation. You know, we look to saying, so there's, you know, heritage existed as a community benefit. So you have to give something back, um, you know, and say, if you're taking away this benefit from the community of heritage, how are you going to, give that back. And, and I accept that it is a challenge to um, put a value on that type of thing. Um, it's hard to say a uh, heritage heritage does, there's no such thing as the heritage dollar. The right. building doesn't cost uh, half a million heritage dollars. And so we can say, build a build a park that's worth half a million dollars. Um, and that's part of the negotiation process, you know, but it's um, definitely the residents in Mississauga are aware of their landmarks. And I know you or I will hear of something if it happens. And, um, you know, every single time there is an inquiry that's brought forward, we look at it and, and there's, it's always gone through the process. The, the issue is, as you pointed out before, sometimes it just takes a long time um, from the decisions that are made ad hoc um, to actually come to fruition on the ground. So a decision could have been made four or five years ago and the permits were issued, you know, in 2015, but it's just getting around to being done at this time, right. you know? And so people may have asked questions five years ago and forgotten. I myself, you know, 
I wasn't, a, I wasn't with the city five years ago. So I've got to go back and look at the file and make sure that it was done properly. And, and, and that's the thing is that it, sometimes this process, it does take a while to get from decision to, uh, to the actual action. Right. But it's always been, there's always, the process is, is always followed and we do make sure that it has been. And, they, and I guess that's also, you, you are also dependent. I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, from a city perspective or from Heritage Advisory Committee's perspective, why didn't you protect that? Um, you need to have the willing partner on the other end too. Um, and, uh, you know, this is still led by those that own property and are looking to change property. And uh, we protect, uh, as we should, private property values and private property rights. And, uh, um, you know, it's about having a, a you, you said it probably best, the compromise. It, it's coming up to a solution that works for everyone. Um, just, I imagine from your end, is not the easiest thing of all, at all times. <laughs> it, it has its challenges, but you know, there again, that's why we have programs like the Heritage Grants Program, where the city will actually help with the preservation of a building to offset those costs because we, the, the city does invest in its, in heritage. You know, there's, there's a, that annual program and it runs and we do that and we we've expanded that program um, to specifically target the commercial property owners to say hey don't don't consider this something that's in your way consider it an opportunity right. and the city is willing to assist with that um, to assist with the preservation part of that to make sure that building stands so that you could build you know you could build a subdivision around the house um, and and really the key is what I really look for is that adaptive reuse piece um, how are you going to especially if you're taking a house that's maybe been empty for five or ten years how are you going to take that and what are you going to do with it that's going to um, bring it back right and it can be rezoned for commercial um, there are a lot of large heritage houses in the city they could be used um, you know they could be uh, divided up internally and turned into condominiums. And so you end up with uh, one house that um, a, a wealthy gentleman lived in with his family now houses multiple families. Right. Um, it's an opportunity to look at some slightly more affordable housing um, options in a building that already exists, you know, instead of demolishing that house and turning it into um, landfill, because that's always what happens with these houses when they come down these buildings generally is that they all just go to a landfill and sit there forever. Um, it's, it's a way of, you know, and, and we're very open to that. It, whatever best use is for that building in its next phase of life, it will continue to grow and change. Um, it may have been a residence for 120 years and then it becomes commercial office space. And maybe in another 20 or 30 years, it'll become a daycare. Um, and then maybe it will go back to being a house again. Right. Um, that's the beautiful part of this is that it's, it's, we're only really dealing with one, one story of that property at this specific point, you know, right. and it's, it's exciting. I, I get excited to see that adaptive reuse and see that change and wonder where it goes from there, Absolutely. you know, and, and go, you know, the goal is to keep that house standing for another 50 years, for another hundred years so that its story can continue. Right. And, and the story that it tells about the community around it. I mean, for the, for the vast majority, uh, uh, you know, people sometimes chagrin. I've had this conversation, but oh, you're changing the use of the building. I said, well, ninety percent of what we do, we interact with the exterior and the roadscape. Uh, so the important part here is we keep that story, that connection of the, that place and that story. But the story of that place evolves. Um, and so I, I don't know. We can look, say, uh, not necessarily a case example, but the Odd Fellows Hall in, in, in Streetsville. It, it's it's a landmark building. It, it's the largest building in, in downtown Streetsville. It's connected to the history of the area since it was built in the 1870s. Um, but the, the use has changed multiple times over its lifetime, and it will change again. Um, but I, you know, without going on a soapbox too much here, uh, the important part is the building continues, um, yeah. and and it, and it tells that story of evolution of the site. No matter what happens to the building, it's probably still always going to be known as the Oddfellows Hall. The Oddfellows haven't been in there for. <laughs> 50 years oh, exactly. before, but uh, um, it tells a story of place. It tells a story of people and place and, and the influence and the, and, the, and the connection between those two elements. And that should continue. And, and that's the thing is, is, you know, you hinted upon the interior versus the exterior. The goal of this heritage, of heritage preservation, of, of maintaining these properties, isn't to create 
uh, museums all over the city. Right. Um, it's to preserve those landmarks, to keep it, to keep those buildings within their context. Very rarely do we go about protecting the interior of a building because that serves no public benefit. Right. The interior of a private commercial residence or, or commercial building or private residence, you know, it's, it's not within the public domain. And so asking someone to maintain a hundred year old floor, again, I, I would love, I love that. And I would love, you know, in some cases I'd love to be able to do that, but that's very much up to the property owner. Right. If they want to do that, um, then I think that's fantastic. And, and we absolutely support that, but it's not the goal. Um, we do that, you know, in, in Heritage Mississauga's offices in the Grange. Um, there's a lot of interior elements that are preserved in, um, in the city's heritage properties that serve that role as a museum like Benary's house. The goal is to preserve those interior elements for as long as possible. Right. But those are public access buildings um, that serve a very specific role. Um, so it's, you know, oftentimes you can take the shell of an excellently well-built building and you can get some fine buildings that were built 100 and 30, 140 years ago, and they are as solid as you will ever find any building. Um, and especially some that are built out of um, Credit Valley stone. Right. You know, those are, built, those are built like castles and they can stand like a castle for probably several hundred years. And the, entire, the interior has been modernized and it's a wonderful house and it continues to be a wonderful house. Right. I guess that's the thing is it has to be functional for its current use. And uses change, and the way in which people interact with spaces change. Uh, what's priority to them changes, and and you know, if if you put up the roadblocks, you're ultimately going to end up with something that you can't work with, uh, or a partner you're not able to work with. Um, so you know, kudos to you to walking that fine line because I, I think the, the compromise is the key here, um, but not in a negative sense. Uh, you know, the, the idea that there's an eternal conversation, uh, education does not stop, and um, understanding the value doesn't stop. Uh, and so it, it's, a, it's a fascinating process for me to be a part of and to, and to see those discussions. But uh, to know, and I hope our, our, our visitors know as well, the reports that we come that come through staff to the Heritage Advisory Committee, they are not, uh, I'll use my technical term from earlier, they're not willy-nilly. Uh, they're yeah. uh, they're, uh, they're uh, very well thought out, very well uh, structured and analyzed and uh, the criteria that is established by the province guides that process um, and and there is uh, and we keep using the word, word process and it sounds like a bureaucratic term and I guess it is to a point but the process is there to ensure that this can take place and uh, for the most part it does not fail um, there, there are examples of course uh, there takes two sides to every partnership and uh, uh, but uh, for the most part the there is uh, a course of action in place that leads to conservation uh, and, and reuse. I think a really good, just a quick sort of last example yeah. is um, the accessibility laws that came into the province about 10 or 15 years ago. And that was a real challenge, um, especially to churches, um, especially heritage churches. And I think that's a good example of finding that compromise because you had very good laws put in place that said every building needs to be accessible. And I like a hundred percent that, of course, that seems like a great idea. A lot of heritage buildings just aren't accessible. And so how do you make a heritage building accessible, maintain those heritage characteristics, try to minimize the amount of impacts to the exterior of a heritage building, but still make it accessible. That is the challenge. And that has been a, a really big challenge. And, and that's, that's where you get into that compromise of saying, you've got two sides that are absolutely correct. You know, heritage is important, but so is, somebody's right to be able to go into that building. Yep. Um, and that's, and that's, that's a challenge, but that's the exciting challenge of saying, you know, there's a time and a place where you consider that despite the importance of heritage, um, people take precedence on that, you know? And so then it becomes a question of how can we put it like, uh, you know, an accessibility ramp on a heritage building in a way that it isn't going to detract um, from the overall, views and so forth. And that is the ongoing challenge. And that happens on private buildings just as much as public. There are people that have accessibility challenges and want to live in their in their heritage house. And they have a right to do so and should feel comfortable being able to come and go out of their own house. That's something that's that's absolutely critical. But that there again, you know, there's always that challenge. And that's why the goal is never permanent preservation. 
you know, because there's actually, you know, no building is built to never be changed. Right. That's never the intent. I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, again, we spoke of Notre Dame, maybe Westminster Cathedral or something, but even then, you know, the, you get into these extreme examples, but a house, a house lives and it changes. I, I, I remember um, a, a, a early university lecture I had uh, dealing with uh, historic buildings and whatnot. It was Professor Thomas McElroy at UTM years ago. And um, uh, by the way, anybody looking for a kind of a really cool book on, uh, on uh, uh, looking for old architecture in, uh, in the province, Professor McElroy's book on searching for old Ontario is a fantastic a chapter on architectural styles. Um, I digress though. The, <laughs> the, um, uh, part of the, that challenge is the built materials, whether they be brick, stone, wood, uh, uh, stucco, whatever. Term, there's always a finite debate. These are these are t materials that deteriorate over time and need it needs care, it needs attention, it needs uh, uh, consideration for how it will change, but how it will be maintained. Um, nothing, no building lasts forever in its original state. Um, and so, you know, that's the, 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 the eternal challenge, but the eternal opportunity as well. And, and uh, uh, hopefully, you know, people coming in and looking, you know, whether they're going in a conservation district or a one-off home somewhere that's either listed or designated, that they see it as an opportunity. They see it as, you know, here's a, a, a cool story with a, 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 a neat building with a cool story with a, with a history that I can add to and be part of rather than simply tear down and replace. Um, exactly. So, uh, I'd, I'd finally like to point out as well that um, everything we've been talking about, um, as I noted, as we've noted time and again, it's a democratic process. Each heritage advisory committee agenda is available to the public on the through the city's websites, through the councils and committees um, link on the city's webpage, and so you know people that are interested can go in and look at the agendas as they're posted monthly and actually look at these heritage impact assessments and conservation reports and conservation plans and so forth um, and take a look at them and just get a sense of, of what it means to go through this. They are not necessarily compelling reads um, <laughs> in that they are highly technical documents, but absolutely take a look at it. Um, and I know you're available you know, for inquiries. They can, you can pass inquiries on to me. Um, happy to have this discussion with anybody from the public that's curious about this, um, you know, but absolutely they're there. They're there not just for the committees and for the staff, but they are there for everybody to look at and understand what is the information that we use um, when these decisions are being made. I enjoy reading them, but I might be in the minority. <laughs> yeah. uh, and also on the uh, Heritage Planning website, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, I meant to check earlier, but you have the, the inventory is, uh, is listed there on the website, I believe, or is it the designated properties that are listed? Uh, the, I the entire Heritage Registry is on there. It is, yeah. it is from 2017, so it's a little out of date now. Um, but there is also um, a portal on our website that you can type in any address in the city and it will tell you whether or not it's it's on the heritage registry or not. Right. I know a lot of the questions I get are from uh, real estate agents when they're looking to, to, to list or potentially list a house and the quick question, you know, is it a heritage house? And, um, you know, there, there are ways to look at that for yourself as well. And, and for anyone who's interested in, you know, walking down a street, if you're, you know, whatever area you're in, we, there are, uh, Heritage Mississauga has guided walking here, self-guided walking tours available that I'll talk about a history of our property. For the most part, we're dealing with private property rights. So please, even if it is a listed property, don't necessarily knock on the door or go stand on the porch or something like that. Um, we are dealing with, with private property for the most part in our city. Uh, so even though they are heritage buildings, they do not necessarily mean that they are public buildings. They are publicly viewable from the road, but uh, um, you, you'll see that as you walk through. These are, for the most part, private friendly homes. The city owns a number of buildings which are public as well. Uh, museums, Heritage Mississauga offices, uh, Clark Hall, so on. There, there are many others as well. But, uh, um, but if you ever have questions, if anyone listening to this has questions about not only heritage conservation, but uh, you know the, the future of a building that you see uh, having you know, suffered some damage or is undergoing repairs or alterations or whatnot, ask the questions. It's a, the, the, there, there's a process that's uh, undertaken, and John can can probably guide through most of the things that are happening there. I can connect those dots uh, to, to John and, uh, um, you know, the information is out there. Um, we're, we're, we don't try to hide it despite the, I guess, in a way, I, I get accused sometimes of hiding things and I say, well, we're hiding them in plain sight. <laughs> <laughs> 
But uh, anyway, John, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I really appreciate your expertise and your guidance on this, not only for myself as a community member and a member of PAC and Heritage of Mississauga, but just uh, having your guidance uh, at, at the wheel when it comes to the process through which you steer uh, her uh, heritage conservation in our city. Uh, we appreciate it greatly. I know that there are others before you uh, that were in that role and we appreciate all the work that they have done over the, over the years as, as not only Mississauga has evolved and is evolving, but also as the Heritage Act has evolved. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I was told one time is, is don't let the losses get you down and don't get the, 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 the winds get you too high. And, and uh, um, we sometimes lament the losses, but we should also reflect on the fact that we have so many heritage assets within the city that really do help tell the story of this place. And, and I think that's important to remember as well. Um, so thank you, John, for very much for joining us and really thank like talking to you. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much for having me on. Always a pleasure. Uh, thank you very much. Awesome. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq, for your question on Cotton Drive. And yes, indeed, Cotton Drive in Port Credit is named for someone, uh, particularly Robert Cotton, who lived between 1809 and 1885. Uh, Robert Cotton was born in Ireland, uh, together with his brother James. Uh, they are often looked at as the founders of Port Credit. Uh, Robert's remarkable home, which was built in the 1850s, survives today as a private home along Old River Road. Robert Cotton came to Canada in 1832. Uh, he established himself first in Cooksville before relocating to Port Credit in the, or what is now Port Credit in the 1840s. Uh, Robert Cotton served as a Justice of the Peace uh, and then on Toronto Township Council, Deputy Reeve in 1867 until 1871, and Reeve, which is now we consider that mayor, Reeve from 1872 to 1879 and was elected as Warden of Peel County in 1873 and 74. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, a prominent early settler involved in early politics, uh, really kind of shaping the community around him, not only with Port Credit, but also having a hand in wider Toronto Township, what is now historic Mississauga. Uh, his home, again, still survives along Old River Road as a private family home. Uh, Robert Cotton died in 1885 at his home in Port Credit, and he's buried at St. Peter's Anglican Cemetery in Arendelle. Uh, so yes, Cotton Drive, named for Robert Cotton, an early uh, prominent resident in the Port Credit community. Um, and Tariq, thank you for uh, the question, and uh, keep exploring the history of your community.